Hi, I'm Terry Coleth, and I'm here today with Professor Adrian Kier, talking about his first series for us in the Fall Academy. This time we're doing the story of China. Thank you for joining me, Adrian. Thank you, Terry. It's always a pleasure to be at Shell Point. Well, China, you've done for us before, and I remember the last time we did China a number of years ago, we thought, how can we talk about such a diverse and gigantic country that's making such an impact on the world in six sessions, and you're in five sessions, and now you expanded it to six? Yes. Well, China um, and India together have made up typically 60, 65 percent of the planet's population almost from the beginning. Mm -hmm. And we tend to think that the West is dominant and that we've been supreme uh, since, say, 1700, um, and that the, all the good things, all the developments, the scientific achievements have come from the West. And there's a wonderful series by uh, Niall Ferguson called uh, The West uh, Versus the Rest. And if you take a snapshot of the last 150, 200 years, um, you would indeed say that the planet is being driven by the West. But you can look at that in different ways, in that um, up until the discovery of the New World and the United States and Western Europe development, really the planet was driven by two countries. One was India, the other was China. And they, can, they made up most of the population, and they still do. All that happened is they lost direction. So the Indians, the Mughal Empire collapsed and the British colonials took over, and that put a stop to their development, and now they're rebounding like crazy. Mm -hmm. China was the same. China was the dominant intellectual, um, scientific um, community on the planet for most of the last 2,000 years. But they lost direction. They, they, their system of Confucianism shut them down from the outside world. They thought that anything outside China was odd, um, different, dangerous, and Christianity cannot be a good thing. So the West was frozen out um, around about um, 1800 or so, and it was considered, as Japan did, Japan became a closed community. Mm -hmm. And that put a stop to what had been a tremendous 2,000 years of civilization. Wow. Um, they invented gunpowder, they invented writing, they invented clocks, and so on. I could go on forever. And then it all went upside down. And because they went looking internally, they missed the Industrial Revolution, they missed scientific developments, they missed the use of gunpowder in weapons, mm -hmm. for instance. And so they really missed step. And only in the turn of the 20th century, when the revolution came and the old Confucian-based um, ancient emperor system went with it, that China made a huge step forward, they thought. Unfortunately, they went in the wrong direction, and they went into communism. And that lost them 50 years, 60 years. And it's only with the death of Mao, the tyrant Mao, that China finally, after two or three hundred years, has got back on track and is now doing what we know it can do. And of course, the sky's the limit. So not only, I've noticed over the previous series you did, not only are they gigantic with the starts and stops you've explained to us, but they're so diverse. You go from one area of China to another area of China to another area of China, and I love how you cover both aspects in your lectures. Yeah. Well, that's a very good observation because we look on China, Beijing China, Shanghai China, Hong Kong China as being typical throughout mm -hmm. the whole of its uh, boundaries. And of course, as you said, it's not. So in the, south, the southern, southeast area, they don't consider themselves to be Han Chinese. The, mm -hmm. the word Han Chinese refers to the Han Dynasty, which was the first time around about 200 BC to 400 AD that China was a major entity mm -hmm. with a single emperor and large um, geographical control. And people refer to that as being the Han Dynasty, mm -hmm. the Han Chinese. Um, those are the people in the east side of the country. But you've got the southeast, which are a different group of people. You've got the Tibet area, different group. And of course, the big thorn in the flesh is the way out west. The Silk Road extended from northern China all the way through to the Mediterranean, effectively through Iran mm -hmm. and other countries in Central Asia. And it went westwards into Islamic territory. Mm -hmm. So the western provinces of China are more Islamic and Middle Eastern, or Central Asian, than they are Han Chinese. So what came to them through and, that? And that is a bone of contention as we speak. 
Interesting. So, taking us from the beginning, as you always do, session one, we're going to start at 400,000 B.C. with the Peking Man. Most people remember uh, high school and Peking Man and what uh -huh. that's all about. Well, of course, um, at the, the early stages of man's development, they spread far and wide. Um, they moved into India, they moved into Southeast Asia, and they eventually made it to China. And so, relatively speaking, China was a very slow student. It took a long time for the developments uh, in the Middle East, um, from the early humanity, to actually move into a long way, in, uh, by foot of course, into China proper. And the Yellow River um, was the cradle of civilization. The Yellow River is called that because um, the high plateau of Tibet drains eastward through uh, the Yellow River in the north mm -hmm. and the Yangtze River in the south and to some extent lower down the Pearl River which goes into Hong Kong. So those are the major water courses of China and not surprisingly that's where civilization grew up. Mm -hmm. The first of the civilizations in northern China were based on the Yellow River, yellow because it carries all the soil that's been washed down from the high plateaus. And so that is where you have constant water, food in the form of fish, transportation, but of course China has been plagued by these life-giving rivers because every now and again, as we know from recent times, Mother Nature plays a trick. And the very beginnings of Chinese uh, civilization were legendary, believed to be that a strong man in northern China was able to build defenses and canals to control the Yellow River. And that's how it started. Fascinating. Well, we're starting right at the very beginning with this nice lead up to why this is all so important to us. And each Tuesday, you'll take us a little farther through the story of China. I hope you take every opportunity to look in your Academy brochure, see the Tuesday um, late afternoon sessions Professor Kerr is giving us on the story of China. Sign up right at the door and get yourself ready for the final session six, what's going on in China today. Fascinating.